Amen. Come on, let every believer say amen, amen, amen. All right, we've been teaching here at Chosen Church. The music can go, thank you very much. Uh, we've been teaching here this month on the goodness of God. We, we've been talking to ourselves here on the goodness of God, and we are just renewing our minds um, please, you can you can come with me to Psalms chapter twenty-seven, verse thirteen. That's where our foundation text is from. Uh, we've been renewing our mind to the fact that God is actually a good God, because a lot of things are happening in this world right now that would cause people to question the integrity of God. In fact, some have gone as far as believing that there is no God. And some are worshipping all kind of things. Some are worshipping stones. Some are worshipping idols. Some are worshipping all kind of things. But we are here at Chosen Church. We are reminding ourselves that there is a God in heaven who rules in the affairs of men. And this God, his character, is goodness. And the Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we, we've been talking to ourselves this month concerning the goodness of God, and we're asking ourselves, how good is God? All right? So last Sunday, we looked at how do we expect to experience the goodness of God? If there is a good God, how do I actually experience this goodness in my own life? Uh, I'm just trying to get there. Thank you for putting that up. Uh, we're talking to us today on the second part of how to expect the goodness of God in your life. Because if you don't expect, life will shape your expectation. <laughs> your experiences in life will shape and condition your expectation if you don't know how to expect anything from life. Look at the man by the beautiful gate. The man had been there for many years. That's Acts chapter 3. He has been there for many years. They used to carry him there. They used to lay him there. Uh, in fact, those people were so committed that after he has begged everybody, they will come back and take him and put him where he needed to go, but they couldn't help him, but they could help him to get to the beautiful gate, all right? But there was a day that the man exercised his expectation. The Bible says he expected to receive something from Peter and John, and that was the end of his story as a lame person. All right. So if you don't know how to exercise your expectation, life would just give to you whatever it can give to you. All right. Let, let's go to Psalm 27 verse 13. David says, I had fainted unless I had, I had believed. That word believe there is earnest expectation. It is conscious expectation. It's a decision that, you know what, in spite of all that is happening in the grand scheme of my life, I will expect to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So David exercised his expectation. He said, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord where? Not when I get to heaven, not when I'm old, not when everything is okay. He says, in the land of the living, I will still see the goodness of the Lord. This, uh, this ought to be someone's decision today. That you know what? Life may have dealt me a wrong hand. People that I uh, thought would help, help me and, and be there for me, they may have disappointed me, but guess what? I've got something in my heart called my expectation. Please tell somebody next to you, you've got something in you called expectation. You've got something in you called expectation. Uh, you may not have the best clothes in town. You may not have the best shoe in town. In fact, you may not be driving the best car, but you've got something that God placed in you at salvation called expectation. And if you will somehow exercise your expectation, I'm telling you, you will start to see the goodness of the Lord. All right. So, so David says, unless I had believed, I wouldn't have seen the goodness of the Lord. So we, we define 
What is goodness? What, what is goodness? Because that word can mean a lot of things, but what, what does the goodness of God simply mean? Uh, let's go to Exodus chapter 33, verse 18. God's goodness is simply the manifestation and the conversion of the glory of God. When the glory of God gets converted to a, to an individual, and I explained this in our first session, that it's important that the glory gets converted for you because we live, this body we are carrying right now cannot stand the glory of God. That's why when we are resurrected after Jesus has raptured us, we will be given a glorious body, a glorified body, so that we can stand in the presence of God. You can't stand before God with this uh, body that you have right now. It's got to be a glorified body. So uh, 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 Moses in this scripture couldn't see the glory of God and live. So God says, Moses, what you're asking for is too much for you. So thank God that God knows what you need. Please tell somebody God knows what you need. Uh, you're asking God for something, but God is like, hey, if I give you that $1 million, that's the end of my, my relationship with you. So God said to Moses, let's convert my glory to my goodness. And he said, verse, if you back up, uh, Moses asked, God, show me your glory. And he said, I beseech thee, show me your glory. Verse 19, God says, I will make all my goodness. And he said, I will make all my goodness to pass before you. In other words, the totality of what I represent, I will make it to pass before you. Uh, did you remember? Uh, David says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Uh, he said, I will make all of this to pass before you. If you can see it, you have literally seen my glory. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious to. And I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy to. I don't know who you are, but the Lord tell, said to tell you that mercy is available in this house this afternoon. If you need mercy, go ahead and receive that mercy. Maybe in your place of work, you're going through a difficult time, but there is a mercy of God. No, you, you did make that mercy mistake. You made that mistake. You did something you shouldn't have done, but the Bible says the mercy of God comes with the glory of God. So when the glory of God gets converted, that's what we call the goodness of God. What is the goodness of God? God's goodness is simply the kindness of God. When God shows you his kindness, that is you experiencing the goodness of God. So last week we began to look at this subject on how do we actually experience this goodness in the land of the living. We looked at number one, we said by renewing our mind, we will be able to see the goodness of the Lord. Why? Because if our mind is not renewed, there is a tendency that the goodness of God will be all around you, but you won't be able to see it. Why? Because you don't recognize what you're looking for or you can't recognize what you're seeing. So, that, like they say, many are the eyes that looks, but few are the eyes that are seeing. You know, right now, as I'm talking, a lot of you are seeing different things. Some of you are seeing my air cord. Some of you are seeing my nice suit. Some of you are seeing my shoes. So people are seeing all kinds of things, all right? And some of you are like, oh, when is it going to finish? The jollof rice is going to go cold, man. So just say what you need to so say. Let's go. <laughs> so everybody's seeing all kinds of things right now. But, but uh, when our minds are renewed, we are able to see when God is good to you. All right. A, a, an unrenewed mind will begin to see all the badness of devil. And you'll be asking, what has God done for me? Forgetting that the mouth that you're using to ask that question, if God should seal that mouth, that's the end of you asking that question. The fact that you are seated in your right mind, that you can even think of what God has not done, that's the goodness of God. Amen. So, so uh, it, it, there's goodness of God all around us. Tell somebody there is goodness of God all around you. I see the goodness of God all around you. I see the goodness of the Lord all around you. But it takes a renewed mind 
to recognize the goodness of God. I pray for you that from today you will recognize the goodness of God. Whenever God shows you his goodness, you will stop and say, Lord, I thank you for this goodness that you have just shown me. So we renew our mind in order to be able to experience the goodness of God. Number two, how do we experience the goodness of God? Number two, by refusing to put our trust in man. That's Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 6 to 8. The Bible tells us that cursed is the individual. You know that word cursed doesn't just mean somebody carrying something they are doing this to. Twe, twe. You are cursed. Yeah, some of you are from, you understand, so those of us from Africa, we understand all those Nollywood. They show us if they want to curse someone, they will say, twe, twe, I curse you. No, no. That word curse, <laughs> that word, some people can curse without saying a word. All right. The word cursed simply means an empowerment to fail. I pray for you. Maybe you feel like there is a curse on your life. I, I stand as God's servant that from this day, that curse comes to an end in the name of Jesus. I don't care who pronounced that curse on you. The blessing of God is stronger than every curse. Amen. I don't care where they send that curse from. I decree and declare right today's day down. There is a shift in the scheme of your life. The things that you used to touch and they don't work from this day forward, I decree and declare, the things you're going to be laying your hands upon, they will prosper in the name of Jesus. Why? The blessing is stronger than the curse. It says, curse is the man. This is why, please, never put your trust in anybody, including yourself. He says, curse is that person, no matter how good and how intelligent that person is, that person is under a curse. But he says, who put their trust in man and make it flesh his arm and whose heart departed from the law. If you keep reading that text, it tells us about that another individual that puts his trust in God. Please say this out with me. My trust in God. My trust is in God. My trust is not in any man. My trust is not in anybody. So I cannot be cursed. <laughs> so if I don't put my trust in man, nobody can curse me. The Bible tells us a curseless curse cannot stand. All right? It then says, blessed. Please say this with me. I am blessed. The man that trusts in the Lord Whose hope the Lord is. Let me see your hand if your trust is in the Lord. If your trust hasn't been in the Lord, you can make that decision right now. Lord, my trust is in you. Glory to God. So when you put your trust in the Lord, you will begin to experience the goodness of the Lord. Let, let's look at more ways of expecting to experience God's goodness. Because David says, if I did not expect it, I wouldn't have experienced it. This is important. Why is it important for us to understand the power of expectation? This is important because our experience in life is a product of our expectation. So the number three way of experiencing God's goodness is by asking God for his goodness in every situation. Matthew chapter 7 verse 11. Matthew 7 11. He says, if you then... Pay attention to this place. Being evil, know how to give what? Good gift to your children. He then says, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So how do I experience the goodness of the Lord? Ask for his goodness. Don't let the goodness of God be too big for your mouth to ask. Lord, I expect and I want to see your goodness in the land of the living. If you ask God for it, he will never turn you away. Matthew 7, 7 says, ask and it shall be given unto you. So how do I experience the goodness of the Lord? There is a God who knows how to give much more. So in order for you to access the much more, you've got to ask God for the much more. Some of you need to amplify your asking. You've been asking God for too little. God says to Moses, I will cause all my goodness to pass before you. So in other words, God don't just want to show you a tiny little bit of goodness. No, it is time to enjoy amplified goodness. 
amplified goodness that nobody can deny. Uh, your family member will look at you and be like, hey, what's going on in your life? It's because the goodness of the Lord is amplified in my life. So you ask God for his goodness. That's one of the ways to expect to experience the goodness of the Lord. How do I experience the goodness of, of the Lord? Number four, by walking uprightly. Psalm 84 verse 11. By walking uprightly, you are expecting to experience the goodness of the Lord. The Lord God is a son and a shield. Look at this. The Lord will give grace and glory. No what? No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. No good things, no goodness. So God is not your problem. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. You just walk uprightly and your life will be littered. Your life will be filled with the goodness of the Lord. Why? Because no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Our actions must align with our expectations. Our actions must be in alignment with our expectations. This is our year of alignment as a church. Is your action in alignment with your expectation, church? Is your action contradictory to your expectations? You can't be expecting God's goodness and believe in a life of recklessness. You cannot be expecting to experience the goodness of the Lord and be confessing negative things, things that are contrary to what you're believing for. If you're believing for healing, you have to talk healing. You can't be talking, uh, uh, I'm weak, I'm feeble, I I'm going to die anytime, I'm not intelligent, I'm weak, I'm all of them, I'm sad. I'm no, 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 no. You've got to speak what you are expecting to experience. It is one thing for God to show you his goodness, and it is another thing for you to see that goodness. Walking uprightly is one of the ways that we are expecting to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Let, let's go to Psalm chapter 18, verse 25 to 26. Psalms 28, uh, Psalm 18, excuse me, verse 25 to 26, in the King James, it says, with the merciful, follow this, with the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. We show thyself merciful. Let me read it properly. Uh, um, thyself merciful. And with an upright man, thou will shew thyself upright. Verse 26, with the pure. Thou will shew yourself thyself pure, and with the froward, thou will show thyself froward. In other words, God's, God is merciful, but are you positioned to see his mercy? It's not that God is not merciful, he is merciful, but if you begin to operate in mercy to other people, if you start to extend mercy to other people, you will begin to experience how merciful God is. Or let's say it this way, the level at which you have given mercy to others is the level at which you have also experienced the mercy of God. All right, he says to the uh, merciful, I will show myself merciful. With the pure, thou will show yourself pure. And with the froward, thou will show thyself froward. God is upright, but are you positioned to see his uprightness? For example, in the Lord's Prayer, let, let's see the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. Matthew 6, 12. A lot of people think we are forgiven when... Uh, we forgive others. All right? That, that's why a lot of people think, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Here is the thing. God has already forgiven us in Christ. Anybody believe that? Your past, your present, and your future sin is all been forgiven already. Now, your capacity to receive that forgiveness that's already available hinges on your capacity to give that forgiveness to others. So if you withhold for forgiveness from people, all you're saying is, Lord, I'm not interested in your forgiveness. Lord, I'm, I'm too holy for you to be forgiven. 
But here is the thing. If you want to experience the reality of mercy in your life, you got to somehow start to extend this mercy to others. So God is a faithful God. watching online so I want to wait for them all right so so mercy and goodness of God largely did de- de- hinges on you and not on God God has already forgiven us in Christ and all we are doing when we forgive others is we are empowered is it's a bit loud please uh, we are empowered to receive the forgiveness that's already available in Christ. Number five, how do I express to expect the goodness of God in the land of the living? Number five, choose to know that all things are working together for your good. Please tell somebody next to you, all things are working together for your good. All things are working together for your good. You've got to make a decision to to believe this. Romans chapter 8 verse 26, he says, and we know... And we know that all things work together for what? For the goodness of God. To them who love God, to them who are called according to his purposes. In other words, expand your knowledge of who God is and his character. It is sad to see, that's what I said at the beginning of this message, that a lot of people right now, they have a bad picture of God. But some of us have tasted the goodness of the Lord. He he don't matter what you say about God, he's too late for you to convince me there is no God. Like I said to you, I was heading to hell, 100 miles an hour, and God in his mercy yanked me out of the road to hell, and now he, he washed me with the blood of Jesus and made me his righteousness. And you want to tell me there is no God, it is too late. I have been experiencing this good God for the last 27 years of my life. (laughs) glory to God you cannot tell me there is no God so you and I have to decide I all things are working together for my good Every disappointment is working for my good. Every negative doctor's report is working for my good. Even the bad report that they are sending to me concerning my children from school, it is working together for my good. But it it, it depends on you knowing that all things are working together for your good. So wipe your tears. Square up your shoulders. Put some strings in your steps because all things are working for your good. Please help me tell somebody close to you, all things are working to your, for your good. All things are working for your good because this is the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living that all things are working together for my good. Knowing God makes you become strong and you can do great things for your God. Daniel eleven thirty two. Daniel 11, 32, he says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall, be, shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and they will do exploits. Say that with me, please. I will do great exploits because I know my God is good. Hallelujah. Number six, how do we experience the goodness of the Lord in in the land of the living? Number six, don't give up or quit because you can choose faith and believe God's goodness in the land of the living like David. Don't quit. Don't give up, but choose to have faith in and believe God or believe in God's goodness in the land of the living. That's Psalm 27 verse 13. He says, I had fainted. It's not the time to faint right now. I said it last week this way, that the cure for fainting is believing. All right? So don't quit. Don't cave in. Don't give up. As long as I've got breath in my nostril, my God is still up to something with my life. Glory to God. He says, I had fainted unless I had believed. To see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, it is very important that we keep our expectations alive. As long as you have breath in you, there is hope. 
Hope is every, is very important aspect of life. Don't allow the enemy to steal your hope. The enemy may steal some money from you, but don't let the enemy get near your hope. If the enemy is coming near your hope, you tell the devil, hey, listen, my hope is a non-negotiable. Glory to God. Why? Let's see, why, why, why do I need to keep my hope alive? Number one, let me give you this very quickly. Why do I need to keep my hope alive? Number one, how, how do I keep my hope alive? Uh, uh, Pastor, uh, my, I feel like my hope is going down. How do I keep my hope alive? Number one, feed yourself in God, with God's promises. Feed yourself with God's promises. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding amen, with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, as ascends to God for his glory. How do I keep my hope alive in the midst of all this bad news, economic bad news, bad news concerning people's health? How do I keep my hope alive? Feed yourself with God's promises. Number two, don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't stand in the path of the sinners. And don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Can the church say amen? Uh, that, that's Psalm 1, verse 1 to 3. Don't, don't hang around hopeless people. You know what hopeless people can do? They will drag you into the same zone. You get hopeful first, and then you can give them hope. Don't sit around people that tell you, hey, yeah, you still going to church? There is no God. No, no, no. Don't hang around people like that. Excuse them. Don't let them talk you out of faith. Here is what Sammy says. He says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Don't hang around people that say, hey, so you're still respecting your, you're still honoring your husband. Don't hang around people that says, oh, you're still loving your wife. Like Christ loves the church. No, 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 no. Don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Why? Because they would draw, they would drown up out of you. But hang around people that says, you know what? Marriage is still honorable. It's still okay to honor your husband. It's still okay for you to love your wife. Glory to God. It's still okay to love her as Christ loves the church. Why? Because if you hang around people whose perspective is out of alignment in no time, you will start to see yourself believing what they believe in. But here is what David says in verse 2 of that Psalm chapter 1. He says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates in day and night. What would happen to this individual? He shall be like a tree. If you go back to that Genesis, uh, uh, Jeremiah 17, there is a sin, uh, it is very, there's a relationship between this man in Jeremiah 17 that put his trust in the Lord and this man that doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruits in his season whose leaf also shall not, shall not wither, and whatever it does, can you handle this? Whatever I do will prosper. Why? Because I'm not hanging around the wrong people. Glory to God. All right, so you can't be believing God and surrounding yourself with unbelief and unbelievers. You can't be claiming to work on your marriage and you surround yourself with people who are constantly advising you to divorce. You can't be believing God for healing and you are listening to those that tell you God doesn't heal again. No, no, I need to hear what does says the Lord because that's how I will keep my hope alive. Number three, how do I keep my hope alive? Number three. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Please tell somebody, encourage yourself in the Lord. Encourage yourself in the Lord like David. That's Psalm 42 verse 11. He says, why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. The help of my countenance. And my God, we all have to become good at talking to ourselves and prophesying over our lives. Everyone uh, and everyone is busy 
<laughs> to talk to you, so you have to talk to yourself. Stop waiting for everybody to encourage you. The Bible tells us that David, after the Amalekites, they attacked them in the book of 2 Samuel. The Bible says after they had cried and they didn't have more strength to cry again, the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. I, I want to encourage somebody. It's time to encourage yourself in the Lord because if you wait for pastor to encourage you, it might be too late. If you wait for your husband to encourage you, it might be too late. That's 1 Samuel, 30, uh, 1 Samuel 30 verse 6. Excuse me. The Bible says David encouraged himself in the law. Let's wrap this thing up. How do I experience the goodness of the Lord? Walk in the reverential fear of the Lord. Let's see Psalm 31 verse 19 and then we'll close. Psalm 31 verse 19. It says, Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who what? Those who fear you. Let, let me give you the right verse there. That's uh, Psalm 31 verse 19. All right, that's it. It says, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for them that fear thee. It's not, it doesn't say to be afraid of God, to be in reverential fear of the Lord. If your life reverences God, I'm telling you, you won't have to be begging God for his goodness. If you make a decision, Lord, help me to walk in the fear of the Lord. And fear of the Lord is one of the seven spirit of the Lord. It was one of the spirit of the Lord that was upon Jesus. And then if you go to Acts chapter 10 verse 38, the Bible says, How God anointed Jesus who went about doing good. If you want your life to be characterized by the goodness of God, start walking in the fear of the Lord like Joseph. Joseph said, How can I do this and sin against God? That's in Genesis chapter 39 verse 8 to 15. He says, how can I do this and sin against God? Even when they put him in prison, the goodness of the Lord broke into prison and brought Joseph out. I'm telling you, if you stay in the fear of the Lord, if they put you in the back of the queue, the goodness of the Lord will locate you there. Why? Because the goodness of the Lord surround those who walk in the fear of the Lord. Let, let's lift up our hands and say, Lord, we receive grace to walk in the reverential fear of the Lord. Lord, help us in our generation where people are making, trying to make God common. Lord, we want to continue to reverence you, to give you the rightful place in our life, to put you first in everything that we do. Oh, we will have no other God beside you. Lord, you are our days and the length of our days. Lord, we reverence you and we give you the rightful place in our lives. Daniel chapter 3 verse Daniel chapter 3 verse 16 to 18. You remember Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. We can have the music in the background please. Nebuchadnezzar said everybody has to bow to the god or to me to the image graven image. But the Hebrew boy said no. We're not going to bow. Did you know there is no physical God right now that everybody is bowing to, but there is a God called money, mammon, that a lot of people are bowing down to. And my wife said something very thin, something that stuck with me. He said a lot of people thought sacrifice is when you're pouring something to a God. You know in the corner of your, of your room I don't know who I'm talking to but the Lord said to warn you do not double it with any other God that's why I think the Lord had me said my own testimony as a young boy I was already going into voodoo the alphas they were already doing concussion for me as a young boy but then the Lord I'm, I'm delivered from those and 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 what my wife let me go back to what my wife was saying uh, a lot of people are sacrificing the life of their children right now for money they are sacrificing their time and energy they are dying even physically 
but they have to earn as much money they can earn. But Jesus says, what shall it profit a man to gain this world and lose his soul? Parent, please, let's prioritize our children. The system is raising children at a very fast rate right now, and everybody pushing their agenda. Please be careful of the cartoons they are watching on TV. Subliminal messages everywhere. And then you see your children doing stuff, and you're like, where did this child got this from? It's because of the stuff they've seen on TV. So Nebuchadnezzar asked them to bow to a God, but they said, no, even, I won't be able to read all of that scripture in, in Daniel chapter 3. They said, you know what? God will deliver us, and even if he does not, we will not bow to your God. But guess what happened? Jesus came into the fire. That was one of the early revelations of Jesus that we saw in the Old Testament. His time to appear hasn't come yet, but Jesus came hundreds of years to show his goodness to three boys that decided not to worship an idol. If you, if you know, God will break rules for those that walk in the fear of him. He will show them his goodness. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, did we not put three people in the fire? Why is the fourth person like this, like the countenance of the son of God? Why? Because they decided, I'm not going to bow to this God that they said we should bow to. You know what? I may not have all the best job in town, but my integrity will not be compromised. Don't sacrifice your soul just because of money. And here is the thing about money, you will never get enough of it. <laughs> but I pray the Lord will help us. That there will be a restoration of the fear of the Lord in the heart of even Christians. That we will not be Christians by title, we will be Christian by deed. That people will start to be interested in Christians again because that name has been bastardized. But it's time for the fear of the Lord to be in our heart, in our places of work. Because I walk in the fear of the Lord, I'm not getting, in the, getting involved in the politics at work. Because I walk in the fear of the Lord, I will not treat my husband this way. That the word says you have to treat men. Because I walk in the fear of the Lord, I will not treat my wife as if she's a footman. Because I walk in the fear of the Lord, I will look after the children that the Lord has given me to raise up. All right? So when you walk in the fear of the Lord, you begin to attract, attract the goodness of the Lord. And then you start to say, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Not just on Monday, not just on Tuesday, not just on Wednesday, not just on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday when I'm in church. Come on, every day of the week, the goodness of the Lord is thrilling my life. Glory to God. My life is characterized by the goodness of God because now I know how to expect to experience the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. If you receive those words, can you say amen? Amen. Let, let's pray.